Okay. Well, I'm told that I should just tell everyone to shut up. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to start, and you can talk as much as you want. Um, so, uh, a little bit unlike Danielle, I thought that this was going to be like a nice topic and connected pains and factor powers, which I thought was a like a big topic for me to cover. Uh, in the process of writing the presentation, I discovered that actually there wasn't that much to say about connected planes and package pallets. Um, so I am going to talk about API design and, and some of the things that I've done with APIs, uh, but the subtitle will really only cover the first you know, quarter or something. Um, so my uh, giant <laughs> is Nancy, uh, sat in the front row here. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight someone kind of closer to the, the LabVIEW group and say that she's done a lot of work with uh, the, the user groups, uh, with CLA summits, uh, the Center of Excellence program, and uh, the, the CPAD track together with uh, John McBee, and uh, especially like the videos that they've provided for some of these talks recently. Uh, it's really great to be able to either rewatch things or um, learn from talks that you weren't able to attend because you were in a different talk. Uh, or if you couldn't attend an iWeek, you can still you know, get these presentations. Uh, and so I, I think that her dedication to yeah, improving software engineering practices in our community is really important. And I just wanted to, to thank her for that. Um, so yeah, moving on, uh, who am I? Uh, I'm a research technician in a fluid mechanics lab in Okinawa, Japan. Uh, I work on a telequet experiment, which is this picture kind of in the top right. Uh, it's basically a pair of rotating cylinders, um, and we fill the gap in between them with some fluid and me make some measurements on torque, on velocity, on temperature, things like that. Um, we have quite a lot of different components in the system. There are motor controllers, various different types of measurements, uh, cooling systems, shutdown systems. Uh, here you can see uh, a kind of black tube pointing at it. This is a, a LDV system, laser Doppler velocimetry. It measures the velocity of something using pairs of lasers. Uh, and that's going to be the focus of the component that I talk about for most of this presentation. Um, I have lots of opportunity to build and refine new APIs because I have quite a few components. And because the users of my components are me and one colleague, uh, when I really screw it up, I can kind of change that. Um, so I know a lot of you don't have that freedom. Um, for the people who have released APIs and have lots of users, you have more things that you have to be careful of when you're changing these things. Uh, you want to be backward compatible. You want to consider when you're writing your API, what can I do to make this flexible to my future changes without limiting myself in what I'm going to be able to do? Um, and some examples of this are, are listed on various NI websites, which I don't have links to here, I'm sorry. Um, but include tips like if you think that you might want to make something a required input, you should start with it being required because it's easy to make it optional, but it's not easy to go the other way. Um, so I think that this slide uh, is just a, an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to start with what is an API. Lots of people have already used this term during this conference so far. So my guess is that that will be quite easy. Um, are people generally familiar with APIs, the concept of an API? Yeah, um, where, do we, where do we specify this? And I'm stretching the definition of API a little bit to include connector panes. Um, you may or may not agree with that. Uh, and then I'm gonna move on to some examples and some conclusions of mine. You can disagree with my conclusions uh, or reprioritize them. Uh, if at any point during the case study you like vehemently disagree with what I think is better, Please tell me, because it would have been better to know that six months ago, but it's better to know it now than in six months from now. <laughs> um, and so, yes, uh, what is an API? It's an application programming interface, or sometimes an application program interface. I'm not sure if there's a meaningful distinction there. Uh, Wikipedia claims it's a set of clearly defined methods of communication between various components. Uh, this is probably accurate, but not the easiest way for me to explain it. So uh, I would say if you take some component and it's kind of like a black box, your API is the things that you put in and the things that you get out and the things that you expect to happen inside. Um, and in LabVIEW, this is kind of the signature of our method. This is the connector pane. Uh, the public methods of a class or the exported functions in a library, this is the public functions of the library, which don't have to be all of the public functions of the classes in the library because you can make your classes have different access scopes. Uh, and any publicly accessible type definitions which was not something that was immediately obvious to me. Um, 
And so this is Richard Gauthier and Stephen Ponto uh, in their 1970 book, Designing Systems Programs. Uh, and they are basically talking about the benefits of well-defined APIs. And they say that if you kind of modularize your program, you have a well-defined segmentation of the project effort and that this ensures system modularity. Uh, each task forms a separate distinct program module. And that at implementation time, which is kind of where we're looking, uh, each module and its inputs and outputs are well-defined. So other people who maybe write code around your code or you when you write code around your own code are not going to be confused about what's supposed to be going on with it. Um, so on the smaller scale, we look at connect planes of VIs. Uh, here, I would include the name of a function as part of its API. I would say that the documentation, the context help documentation, the VI documentation, is not a part of the API, uh, basically because if you change it, it doesn't break anything. Uh, I'm going to then say, even though that was a logical explanation of why I wouldn't include documentation, uh, I'll argue against it when I say that I might consider the labels on my inputs and outputs to be part of my API. Uh, they're not really, only the data types. But uh, on the next two slides, something, I'm going to show an example of the and I think you'll agree that there is a preference. Uh, on large scales, public functions of classes or libraries. This is a PPL that has three functions and three actor framework methods. Uh, and all of this is public, so a lot of my actors inherit from this, and they do those things. Uh, and we can highlight our APIs on package palettes. Uh, you don't have to put your entire API on a package palette. Uh, if you have some really perverse desire, you can put private methods on a package palette. You won't be able to use them anywhere, but um, you can. Uh, so to start at one end, the connect planes, uh, this is the lowest kind of thing that we can design in LabVIEW uh, for reuse of some kind or, or just use of some kind. Uh, and this is equivalent to a function signature in a text-based language. We can get lots of the same recommendations. If I give you this VI, you're probably not going to have much of an idea of what it does. Uh, Arguably, it can be the same as this VI, uh, which has all of the same inputs and just a name and some, some labeling. Uh, and even without a description, you can probably, uh, I didn't create this VI, it has nothing behind the connector pane, but um, you could imagine the contents of this lock diagram, what it might do, how it might behave. Um, you get an idea of, of like what it should be doing. And so this is something that like we should really strive to, to achieve. Um, yeah, so relative to, to text-based languages, we have the same kind of things. Uh, we shouldn't require huge numbers of inputs. If you have like 20 connectors, maybe that's a bad thing. Uh, we should try and give them helpful or descriptive names. Uh, it may be that these are not always present. Uh, it may be that you don't see them all of the time, but when you look at the context help, it's useful to be able to know what you're supposed to be connecting to something. Uh, when it's appropriate, we should group inputs with clusters or classes. Uh, we shouldn't then extend that to, I have 20 inputs, and I've heard that it's bad to have 20 inputs, so let me put all 20 of these inputs into the same cluster and then say that it's good. Um, so, yeah, don't group unrelated inputs, uh, basically because you're going to end up with a bunch of things that depend on things that they shouldn't depend on. And if you use a lot of global data, or if you use any global data, really, uh, this can be a sort of hidden dependency. Your things will depend on something that isn't obvious from your connector panes. Uh, in terms of package palettes, uh, QuickDrop will search the palettes. This is great. Uh, I very rarely use the palettes, but I put things on them to make sure that they appear in QuickDrop. Um, it will also search project and dependencies, I think. Uh, at least it seems to, and so that's pretty nice. Uh, it does slightly alleviate the need for a palette, but uh, it's good for discovery. You should try and make them nice. Uh, you can highlight specific VIs which you think are important for your API, and using good icons is important. Uh, this is one library that I have written that creates results data types, basically, uh, and I've tried to group things on a top level that are more basic operations and then have more detailed things in sub-palettes. 
Um, if you build PPLs, uh, Matthias was talking about this yesterday, the palettes will often contain the library files, not the PPLs, depending on how you build them. So be careful with that. Uh, in my projects now, I have things on the palettes that are all linked to my libraries. And then I have things in dependencies that are linked to PPLs. So if I do quick drop, I get two of the same thing. Uh, and I should either replace those or I should remove the palettes. Um, so far, I've been using PPLs for not very long, so I haven't gone around to it. Uh, so to move on to some examples, uh, I apologize to people who saw my presentation at NI Week. Uh, you might have seen these two slides a little bit before. Uh, this is measuring temperature. You would be forgiven for not knowing that. Um, in this case, it's not doing very much, but my read VI in the, the center of the timeout case has uh, a bunch of cluster inputs. Some of these are clusters of clusters. Uh, and I really considered doing like this polished thing with a video demonstration so that it looked nice and clear. But I realized the problem was uh, if I record myself and I practice it a few times, then it looks like it's simple. And if I record myself and I include all the time it takes me to work out what the hell I'm doing, then it takes half an hour. So um, you just have to trust me. If you have not copied this from an example, uh, it's really hard to use. And Every time I came back to it, I was like, why did I do this? What was my motivation? <laughs> so uh, I replaced it with this. And now I separated things out according to their responsibilities a little bit better. Uh, I have an SPI class, which takes on my communication responsibilities. And then an LTC2983 concrete class, which is just the name of the uh, printed circuit board module, uh, the, the IC on the board. And that carries out the, the temperature measurements and it calls into init swap and close <coughs> to get communication across the SPI interface. And now if I want to move from my X series DAC board uh, to the Serial system that we recently bought, then I can replace the SPI class and be like, great, my system still works, um, which is nice. In these two examples, uh, I'm gonna tell you that you prefer the one on the right. It's not <laughs> visually that different, but you can see that on the right, I can switch between a simulated version and a real version with just a, a case selector, um, a select node rather. Uh, I have init, read, and close, which are fairly kind of expected forms for making a measurement. On the right, uh, on the left, sorry, uh, you know, you can uh, take a gander. Um, I also have keep Q errors as one of my constants there because they also take inputs to a specific type of message queue. And when I wanted to reuse this, I discovered that if I didn't connect the message queue, I got a bunch of errors and then I couldn't read the temperature because I didn't connect the status message queue, which seemed a little bit superfluous. And my immediate solution to that was to add extra things that say ignore the errors. Uh, I don't recommend that as a good solution. Um, so yes, I'm gonna assert that this is not a difficult choice. Do people mostly agree with me? Not very much movement, but okay. Uh, so then I'm gonna talk about modifying an API next. This is gonna be kind of the bulk of my talk. Uh, and I'm gonna subtitle this uh, a case study in mistakes I've made. Um, so I'm gonna be looking at the, the LDV component, the laser system and things that I've done. Uh, first, I'm gonna start with some quotations from David Parnas. This is from his 1972 paper. Uh, on the criteria to be used in decomposing systems into modules. And uh, he's talking about a, a quick indexing or generating system. Uh, for people who don't know what a quick generator is, uh, it stands for key word in context, I think. Uh, and he gives an explanation in his paper, which is supposed to give you all of the information you need to understand it. Uh, I did not find that it helped me understand it, so then I went to Wikipedia, which had an example, which was much better. Uh, and basically, it, it creates uh, alphabetized lists of index notations. Uh, it's not important for the purpose of this talk, but he decomposes it in two ways, one in which he considers like uh, procedural steps and says, these are the steps that my system has to take. I'm gonna have one module for each step. And the other in which he says, these are the things that my uh, system has to act on. These are the responsibilities of something. And I'm gonna decompose it according to its responsibilities or its data. Uh, and he suggests, and I think that people would now probably agree with him, uh, that it's better to do the latter. 
uh, and that even though it means that your modules maybe keep being called in like lots of different steps, if you have something that is in charge of your line alphabetization, you're going to need to keep calling it every time you want to alphabetize something. But that's better than having it like step through procedurally and have to keep moving lots of different things around. Um, he, in the same paper, talks about the benefits of modular programming. I'm only going to highlight the second benefit, but I didn't feel like it was appropriate for me to cut out his other benefits. Uh, he says it should be possible to make drastic changes to one module without a need to change others. Um, here I have a video of somebody else's laser system. Uh, and this is essentially uh, what I'm talking about for the rest of this talk. Uh, you have some pairs of lasers. They meet somewhere. You measure the velocity where they meet. Uh, you have a traverse stage that moves the laser backwards and forwards and up and down, whatever. Uh, you may have additional settings related to the power of the laser, the frequency that you're interested in, some validation criteria. Um, so I'm going to start by suggesting what I thought I needed to do when I was writing this component. And uh, I decided we wanted to allow a scheduling of a sequence of multiple laser measurements. So uh, I want to move to different positions. I want to take measurements at each of these positions. Uh, they may have different settings at each different position. So I need that to be something that I can change quite easily uh, and store in a reasonable manner. And I'd like a, a simple user interface that will allow me to edit either one position or like a selection of positions to have the same settings. Uh, we have some vendor provided software for this, which does some of these things. Uh, and we decided it wasn't really enough of these things, so we wanted to, to do it ourselves. Um, some further requirement that I discovered whilst I was making mistakes uh, was that I probably want my user interface to be a little bit more modular. Uh, being able to remove it or change it would be good. Uh, that's going to become more obvious a few slides later. Uh, I've written this with the Active Framework. Uh, some of my colleagues are not familiar with the Active Framework. And in our lab, this is one of the most commonly reused pieces of hardware. Uh, it would be nice if I can write my code in such a way that other people are comfortable using my code if they prefer without needing to study the active framework. Stop using it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, responsiveness, the, the hardware calls take a couple of hundred milliseconds. Um, this isn't disastrous if you have one. And if you have to make 10 changes, then it's OK if it takes 10 changes time. There are better ways of doing this in this specific case. Uh, but I discovered some more changes that made that worse. So I'm going to start with what I first created. Uh, this worked. Uh, I was reasonably OK-ish with it. Uh, it had a bunch of problems. I'm going to talk about some of them. So I started with one library containing all of the code from the component. Uh, I still have one library containing all of the code for the component. Uh, I'm not unhappy with this decision. I have one class for my real uh, like processor. This is like the box that takes the measurements and then does something. Uh, and that inherited from Acta uh, in the first case. And then I had two child classes. And this, I would say, is not a great design. Uh, I had the PDA class. This is a specific type of LDV measurement. And it, it is like reasonable to model. This is a subtype, I think. And then I had a testing class, and I made that a child too. And I would say that's probably not a great decision. Um, and then one class for settings at each position, and three classes and an actor uh, relating to a mesh or like a concept of a series of positions. Um, this was a part of my class hierarchy. I have highlighted some bits in boxes. Other bits are kind of color matched to the, the boxes on the sides. Uh, the blue box is the package I showed before. I'm not going to talk about it. But the red box in the lower left is these LDV actors. Um, and that's going to be my focus for the first couple of examples. So uh, this was my initial problem. Uh, these are the messages of my system. Uh, each action, and I have quite a lot of settings for the system, had its own message. They are all basically the same. They call into some com object and set some values, and I felt like this was a little bit excessive. Um, 
And so my first thought was, well, I can just group some of those calls and try and make them uh, together. Then I will have fewer public VIs. My API will shrink quite a lot. This will be great. Uh, the problem with this is that the number of unnecessary operations goes up. So I'm going to go forward two slides because I didn't do this well. Uh, here, I'm calling four of my previous methods in one VI and taking all of the inputs that are specific to one channel of the laser. And this is great. I don't need to call those four anymore. They can become private. But the problem is that if I only want to change the voltage setting, the other three are all going to be updated. And if they take 100 or 200 milliseconds each, then now I'm wasting 600 milliseconds. Uh, and that makes it way less responsive. Um, I also changed the inheritance of the actors and created an interface class. Uh, this, I think, was quite a big improvement for me, especially in terms of testability. Uh, when I had the kind of fake system inheriting from the real system, any shared code, I had to either put it in a sub-VI that they both called, or I had to uh, you know, try and separate it or copy and paste it or something, uh, because I couldn't call the parent node because that did real things, and I didn't want to do real things in my fake system. Uh, in Active Framework, you can overload receive message, and then you can kind of filter them a little bit. And that's clever, but you have quite limited handling because unless you really like over-design your receive message, uh, you're going to have to write some code somewhere, and you don't want it all to be in the same thing. Um, here, I can put my shared code in my interface, and I can keep my driver-like code, all of the hardware calls, in the concrete class. The simulated class now becomes very simple. If I want to read a fake measurement, I can just put random number on the block diagram. And, you know, I have a measurement. Uh, yes. Good. Uh, this was my reduction of public VIs. But it does have this, this problem. So I spoke to some people about this at NI Week. And their suggestion was that basically I should just keep track of what changes I have and then only update the things that really changed. So this wasn't an API change. This was a, a change that I could make internally to my component. And basically, I just take the new settings and the old settings, compare them, and then get an array on the right-hand side here of the changes that I actually want to make. Uh, this reduces some of my problems. Um, I guess this was my third implementation. Uh, and then next, I wanted to look at my settings classes. Uh, are there any questions so far around this? Comments, criticisms? Yes. If you, if you go back to the previous slide where you have the comparison between the type defs there, if one of those type, if the type def contains an array, I'm not, I think sometimes you will get a, an erroneous e equality. Uh, basically, when I'm saying you have to create your own sub VI to make sure that you run through all the elements of the array if the type def contains an array. If it doesn't, uh, it's not a problem, I think. Uh, that's an interesting point. None of these clusters do contain uh, arrays within them. Uh, I didn't know that, so I guess that would be important to consider if they did. Um, the problem that I, I found here was that the clusters have different lengths, so it will pad them with false values, but they get dropped later on anyway. Um, so, uh, anything else? No. Uh, so I was a little bit unhappy with having four classes, and when I needed to make changes to settings, I thought, okay, where do I make this change? Uh, I'm gonna briefly discuss what each of these classes does, and then maybe we can look at the possibility of simplifying this slightly. So I have four classes here in the green boxes, my actor on the left and three classes on the right. Uh, I'm just going to quickly quote uh, Robert Martin from Clean Code. He says, uh, classes and objects should have noun or noun phrase names like customer, wiki page, account, and address parser. Avoid words like manager, processor, data, or info in the name of a class. A class name should not be a verb. Um, this, 
I think is a little bit tricky to pass in that format, so I rearranged it in bullet points because apparently you can consider these as kind of separate sentences. Um, and it's not that manager, processor, data, or info are verbs, um, which is how it kind of looks in the continuous phrase section. Uh, and the problem that I'm highlighting here is that I have a mesh actor, and this is a little bit like manager. Uh, it's not super obvious why I have a mesh actor, apart from that I wanted to have some actors. Um, so uh, I'm going to just go through the, the simpler classes first. I have an LDV configuration. Uh, this holds a full set of all of the settings that are relevant to a single position. Uh, and I can load the settings from this class or save them to a class. I can put them on disk or load them from disk. Uh, it has no information about position or the translation stage. It doesn't know any of these things. You can substitute them however you want. Uh, this seems reasonably okay. I thought that the API and the module design here was fairly reasonable. Um, then I have a position class, uh, which contains a, a single LDV configuration. This is composition that we heard about yesterday. Uh, and a position cluster, it, has X, Y, and Z positions, it knows where it should be. Uh, and a timestamp, I'm undecided on the timestamp. It tells me when I last acquired this position. I thought that might be useful data to display. Uh, it's not really something that the position class needs to know about. So this might be some sort of pollution. Uh, and I would suggest that if you are designing classes, you should try not to jump two bits of things into the same place. Here, it's a quite simple class. It's not a big deal, but it adds a couple of VIs that are like update timestamp that have nothing to do with positions or configurations. Um, and then I have a mesh class, which has an array of position class objects. So this has VIs to manipulate the contents of the array. This is good. I can add positions. I can insert them somewhere in the middle of the array. I can remove positions. It's quite easy to unit test to make sure that when I remove them and I have things selected from a multi-column list box, I don't accidentally move my indices. That took me a little while to figure out. Um, but it also holds the current index and allows stepping forwards or backwards. And uh, maybe I can get a show of hands on who thinks that's a good thing. One, two, three, a few people. Who thinks that's a bad thing to see if that's the rest of the room or just people as tired and waiting for lunch? <laughs> uh, okay, I have a, a mesh class. It has an array of different positions. Uh, I also store the current positions index and I have VIs to allow me to move to the next position or the previous position. This is something you need to do often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm a little torn on this. I thought it was a good idea for exactly that reason. Uh, I, I do want to move to the next position. That's the most common way I'm going to use this class. I have an array of positions. And, uh, you should, uh, maybe that sounds like, like an iterator pattern or something to like step through. Mm -hmm. That might be worth looking at. Uh, so I have some uh, VIs to allow me to put things in the middle of the array or move things around, and I wanted to wrap this in a class that didn't make it difficult to use my array, basically. I guess the, the benefit of the class existing at all is that it encapsulates some of this and gives me these common operations that I want to do in a format that is easier for me to use. Uh, without having to look at inserting into an array or deleting from an array and making sure I get the right indices when I delete them like in non-continuous blocks. If I select indices two, four, and seven from my array and I say I want to delete these positions, then if I delete index two, then delete index four, then delete index seven, I will not in fact be deleting two, four, and seven from the original array. That, that sounds good, but that's a VI question. Right. Right. Uh, maybe I misunderstood the question. Uh, yeah, okay, so, so your point is that these VIs don't need to be a member of this class. They could be reused things in a separate library or something. Uh, that 
that's a good question, and it might be entirely unnecessary. Perhaps I should just get rid of the class. Um, something has to hold the array. I thought this was a good use. Perhaps it's not. Uh, the kind of consideration I have with the, the index is that by, oh yeah. Well, it seems like what you're doing is you're simplifying, um, it seems like you're simplifying the process for somebody else to use your library. So instead of someone having to go make sure they really understand all of the array manipulation VIs and understand the problem of the 247 that you just mentioned, you're wrapping that around in another method and you're presenting to your other peer, here are the things that you're gonna wanna do with this mesh. You don't have to worry about the rest of the array VIs, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna give you a very simple API. So I, I think sure. there's value in that. And, and maybe if you had a team of 10 people, there'd be even more payback from it, but I don't see that there's a problem in doing it, and there's a value add. Right, so uh, I guess I agree with you on, on the value, but now I'm gonna consider whether those VIs would be better outside. If I have them outside, then I need to expose the array kind of publicly, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. um, Another option would be to have a library just for that array manipulation mm -hmm. and expose the DBR reference that handles that houses the array. Right. So that way um, you still simplify the sure. connection to the outside world. Or I, I guess I could have accessor methods for the array and uh, make them community scope or something and have a, a library with array manipulation. Um, the, the concept with the index, uh, essentially I wonder if it's something that the caller needs to know about and that the mesh itself doesn't need to know about its current position. Um, Thank you for the discussion. I will think about this some more. I will say avoid community scope, that's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm tempted to agree, but this looks like maybe a good use case. <laughs> Is that gonna be something that's gonna make things worse when I change namespaces and build DBR? Oh, when, uh, when you are going to compile code and uh, then try to relink with the friends of your compiled code, it, it, it crush, it, it doesn't work. It it breaks the, the the it breaks the code without giving any really information unless go to the development environment to fix the issue. And when you go to the development environment, it works. So right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a good point. Perhaps community scope is a little bit tricky or risky to use in built code. Is that basically the? Yeah, the I point? really try to avoid community scope. I, I work around that. Really, I have too many issues with community scope. Uh huh. Um, well, I, I can make my uh, library of, well, I could make my library of array manipulations internal to the library of LDV things, but then I don't really gain a lot because they're not reusable without loading the rest of the library, right? Um, I'm gonna move on a little bit and talk about the mesh actor. Uh, so the problem here was that uh, essentially this is a user interface. Uh, and I have two sub-panel VIs, uh, and then I can load one or the other, or both, into uh, various sub-panels, which seemed like a, a nice idea, it's pretty good. I like sub-panels a lot. You can insert things into sub-panels easily and move them around your application. Uh, that's great. The problem is that when I did this, I didn't really consider how I was gonna programmatically access this component, so my interface to this became largely oh, well, you open the sub-panel and then you click. And uh, that's not great. Because it's an actor, I at least have the messages, so I can access it, but that wasn't my kind of primary access method, and I think that was a mistake. Uh, now I feel like, well, I'm gonna keep going and then I'll conclude th the end of the slide. Uh, it has some sub-VIs that, that handle the user interface, the multi-column list box, things like that. Uh, tags for menu operations. And it manipulates the mesh object. Uh, basically, this means that for every operation that my mesh object had, I had a mesh actor VI that just wrapped it, and then a message class for each of those methods, which results in quite a lot of stuff that does not a lot of anything. Um, and if I really wanted an actor, I could have made my mesh an actor and ditched the mesh actor class. And if I don't care for an actor, then I can probably just ditch the mesh actor class. Um, 
as I've moved forwards, I've looked to have a kind of controller actor instead and just have it contain a mesh um, rather than using the mesh actor object. Um, and uh, as I was mentioning, there's a quite tight coupling between my user interface and my functional code because I'm tying myself into this sub-panel. Like so. uh, well, you mentioned uh, getting rid of the mesh actor and then having the controller own the mesh, but could uh -huh. the controller just own directly the array of, and get rid of, I mean, do you need to add that extra layer of complexity? I'm, uh, I'm trying to understand what you're trying to get out of adding the extra layer. I think that's the same question, right? Like I could move the entire array into the controller or something, mm -hmm. but then all of the operations that I want to carry out on that array either have to be in a separate library and then I expose the array, which I don't want to do, or I, they have to be inside the controller, in which case the controller just has a bunch more VIs and I might as well put them in a separate class. Okay. Um, is that, okay. Um, yeah, this is that. Um, so my ongoing efforts uh, to try and move forwards with this are mostly focused at the moment around uncoupling myself from my user interface. Uh, and I think I'm gonna do that with some user events. Uh, basically, my idea here is that I can have type defined references, uh, like a cluster of references, and these can give all of the possible user events that I think that my code should send or receive, and then specific user interfaces can implement whichever subset of those they want. Uh, obviously, if my user interface doesn't implement the emergency stop event, uh, that might be a problem, but at least it's a localized problem to that user interface. Um, and kind of the functional code can be separated, so if there's something that causes an emergency, even if I don't display that it stopped, it did still stop. Um, the benefits will be that I can you know, remove the user interface or change the user interface uh, without having to wonder, am I gonna break a bunch of code because my event structure was previously just handling value change events of all of these buttons. Um, any questions, thoughts on this point? Did you make at any point a diagram of all the actors involved and all the modules and components involved? Uh, I've tried a couple of times for this component and other components with things like uh, YAD. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, mm. but uh, it's a diagramming tool. Um, occasionally, I create diagrams that I find really useful. Mm. And sometimes I create diagrams that take me a bunch of time and then I'm like, okay, <coughs> this isn't very illustrative. Yeah, yeah um, the thing that I'm uh, noticing in some of the questions is that um, having a diagram and again, reading it in a spoken language would help you solve some of the, right. the uh, riddles. And it, it does take a long time, but how many times have you gone through? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think that's definitely true in terms of the mesh actor. Like it, it seemed like a good idea, but when I tried to write down what it does, I'm like, well, uh, actually what it does is just forward all of these things to this other object that does all of these things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So now I'm like, well, hang on, maybe this isn't necessary. But um, yeah, maybe if I had been more careful in my planning earlier. But I, I'm having that conundrum then, so like now, now that I'm asking all these questions, like go back and. Right, right. So in the process of writing a couple of slides ago with, uh, like here, mm -hmm. uh, I feel more confident about the purpose of some of these classes now. I'm like, oh, actually, that, that's kind of like good. That, that does what I want. Yeah. And, then here I'm like, oh, actually that's not that good. It doesn't really do anything. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that, that discussing it uh, or writing it is useful. Um, perhaps if I discussed it more closely with my colleague, he might have had some of these observations. Um, but in some ways it's it? easier to discuss with the diagrams. Yeah, mm. yeah, I need to get a rubber duck. Um, <laughs> and so, yes, my approximate conclusion is that uh, making these changes has made my code 
more modular and reusable. It's a little bit more separated out. Uh, I still have actors that do most of my kind of controlling of the system, uh, and I'm quite happy with that because I like actors. But it's not that difficult to implement something that doesn't require those things if you wanted to. Um, my classes uh, have become and will continue to become a little bit easier to understand or to describe. Uh, I don't know if it was Robert Martin or not who suggested that if you can't describe your sentence, I think we had this, this kind of quote yesterday, if you can't describe the purpose of your class in one sentence without using things like or, but, uh, you know, kind of conditional things, then maybe you need to simplify it. Um, and, sorry, no. Uh, and in the future, I might be able to run this without any user interface at all. Uh, that might be nice if I wanted to do something like a web services or something um, and kind of offload my user interface elsewhere. Um, to almost conclude, uh, I just wanna highlight the benefits of unit testing as a design tool. Um, if I can't unit test things, this might be an indication that it's quite difficult to use. Um, so if I have lots of things that are difficult to set up or I need to run like four VIs in the same sequence every time, perhaps these are indications that I have some problems that I could change my API and help mitigate for my users, even though in this case my user is typically me. Um, if I have really huge clusters that need to be filled with lots of different things, then that's probably gonna be a pain to set up while I'm writing unit tests. Uh, obviously, unit testing frameworks will help you with these things, but it's still more difficult than if you hadn't had to deal with them. Um, these can be things that can prompt you. They won't fix your problems, but they might tell you, hey, this is a pain in the neck. You should consider whether it has to be a pain in the neck. Um, in terms of integration tests, which I also usually just run with a unit testing tool. Um, yeah, the, the group series of sub-VI calls, if you're always calling the same sub-VIs one after another, maybe they don't need to be separately available. Um, if there are VIs that you can't call in a test, uh, maybe they don't need to be public. Uh, and if you have a bunch of really ugly wires everywhere, perhaps you could just rewire it a little bit. Um, and it's probably telling that some of my parts of this component are less well tested, and I would suggest that they might be the worst parts. Um, so uh, I can't say that I have done this and it has made my code fantastic. I can say that it, I've done this in places and it's made those parts better. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I wanna suggest things that are good to have in an API. Uh, I've ordered them kind of by how I feel about them, you can reorder them as you see fit. Uh, I think clarity, uh, the ability to understand something is really important. Uh, for me, if I have to spend more than a few minutes looking at a bunch of VIs and like, what, which one do I start with? Where do I go from here? What's the point? Uh, that annoys me a lot. Uh, and it wastes a bunch of time, which is not good. Uh, <coughs> intuitiveness, consistency, and ease of use, these are kind of related. Um, I would say in terms of consistency, that's maybe with regards to your own API, whereas intuitiveness might be in terms of other people's API. So if you're writing some measurement system, perhaps you can look at the DACMX calls uh, or something like that. Perhaps there's an API that you prefer to DACMX that you could use as a kind of template to model on. Uh, if you find that the DACMX template is occasionally confusing, you can look on the forums for Kevin Price um, and he will probably have the answers. Um, in terms of documentation, uh, like I said at the beginning, this isn't really a part of your uh, API, but I do think that it will help you understand an API and that might save you from some frustration. Uh, completeness, I've listed here, is the ability to do everything that you can possibly do with your component. Uh, your mileage may vary. You may want that or not want that. Uh, if you expose everything, you end up with a lot more VIs, but some more flexibility. If you don't expose things, then you have less stuff to maintain. That might give you a better experience. Yes? About documentation, it might be a little bit extreme, but I 
started to uh, do the documentation even before the API, and you save a lot of iterations of coding because you, when you write what you think it should do, you realize that maybe you were wrong initially. Mm -hmm. So in my kind of new workflow, it's documentation first, unit test, second, code, third. Okay, yeah, I think that's probably a, a pretty fantastic idea. Um, and have the unit test written by someone else without having access to the source code. That would be nice, but not always practical, <laughs> uh, especially if you are more it's or less a one person. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll see. Perhaps I can get my colleague to write some unit tests. Um, I think that we're agreed on the value. Uh, we're not sure. Uh, yeah, my time's up, so uh, it's lunch. If you have questions, we can talk outside. Uh, or you can skip lunch and keep talking here. But um, I'm guessing I won't have many takers on that. So, yes, thank you.